action. Welcome to IDEA 2 IPO. Hello, my name is Jennifer. IDEA 2 IPO has been holding tech startup events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. Check out our schedule at idea2ipo.com. Our featured speaker today is Roger Royce, and he is one of the top venture capital attorneys in Silicon Valley. And he's also passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. All right, well, thanks. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Roger Royce, as you heard, I'm gonna spotlight this. Um, I'm a tax and corporate partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone. I'm resident in the Palo Alto office here in sunny California, not too sunny today though. Um, and I do work with emerging growth and venture capital. Uh, thank you ID to IPO uh, for hosting me here today to talk to you uh, about uh, preparing your company for venture capital. So uh, no, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to work with me. My clients are from all over the world, um, more and more so these days. So before we get started, and because there's still attendees uh, logging in, I just wanna mention a couple things. First of all, feel free to use that chat feature uh, to go ahead and, and chat with us and, and post things uh, into the chat box. If you wanna to talk to me or the attendees, um, I'm gonna give a presentation for about an hour and if you have questions, I'm gonna have a question and answer period at the end of that hour for about a half hour. If you have questions, type those into the Q&A box. Don't use the chat box for that. That just gets way too crowded. Use the Q&A box and uh, I'll get to your questions at the end of the hour. So again, this is ID to IPO. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're tweeting, use hashtag idea to IPO. Um, and, and I hope you are. So uh, this is being recorded. Uh, if you're here, you're going to get an email from me after this is over. You're gonna get a copy of my slides and a copy of the recording. So um, you know, you'll have an opportunity to see this again. I've posted in the chat box, my YouTube site where I'm going to post the recording as well. Uh, you should go there. You should watch this recording. You should watch my past recordings and you should hit that subscribe button. Uh, so you don't miss any of this awesome content that we have oftentimes. Alrighty, let me, first of all, I'd like to know who's actually out there in the audience. We've been doing sort of our informal, informal poll through the chat box, but Zoom gives us this very formal way of doing things, so let's give it a try. So who is in the audience? Are you a startup entrepreneur? Are you an established company? Are you an investor? Are you a service provider like me, a student or professor in government? Are you paparazzi? Um, what do we have here? Almost everybody's a startup entrepreneur. Um, normally we get a little more diversity, uh, but that's all right. Uh, today, almost everybody is startup entrepreneur. I see most people are from North America too, although we've got some good European representation. All right, well, uh, I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds because 90% of you are startup entrepreneurs, a few service providers, some students, uh, but with 80% of the results in, we have 90% startup entrepreneurs. Good to know, that's good to know, all right. Let me end the poll. And uh, since we're at it, where are you all from? Because uh, I'm a little curious as to how that breaks down in terms of percentages. I know we have um, know we have a lot of folks from North America today, but I'm curious. Okay, so uh, Silicon Valley's uh, not as well represented as normal today, only 14% so far. Other North America, 66%, holy cow. Uh, we've got Western Europe, we've got Eastern Europe, we've got Latin and South America this time around. Uh, we even have some Asia, even though, wow, we're all over the world. 
and I know there was somebody here from Nigeria because I saw it in the chat. You know, I was actually invited to speak in Nigeria in two weeks in Lagos at the, um, the uh, it's a technology conference. It's a startup technology conference, but I'm going to be appearing virtually uh, this year. Next year, I'll go there. Um, so there's a big tech scene going on in Africa. I know, a big startup thing. Okay, well, we've got 65% other North America, 10% Silicon Valley. That might be a new record low <laughs> in terms of Silicon Valley attendance. Uh, Asia, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and Latin and South America are almost equal between four and 6% uh, as well as other. I'm really curious as to who that other is, you know, so let me know. Uh, I may have to change my, uh, my polling questions. All right, let's end the poll. And with that, I think I've gone through all of my, my um, yes, I've gone through all of my housekeeping questions. So let's go ahead uh, into, give me a second here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So what you are going to see now, uh, hopefully, Not yet. Now, you should be seeing uh, my slides. Um, in fact, I'm sure you are. If not, somebody should let me know. But that should be my slides. Okay, again, how to prepare your startup for venture capital investment. This is part one. Uh, we're going to focus on the questions that you probably saw on the meetup page um, and go through you know, maybe more of the basics today and maybe more of the technical stuff next time we do it. This is this is always a tough one because there's so much to talk about. If you were with us last week, you know, we just started to scratch the surface and talk about venture capital. Uh, and what come last week, we our idea IPO event was on how to was funding 101. And one of the sources of funding, of course, is venture capital. And of course, I had to put up a picture of a venture capitalist, so you all knew what I was talking about. And we just started to talk about that. We're gonna talk more about that this time. So uh, I'm not gonna repeat everything I said last week, but I am going to tell you a couple of the things that I said last week. And number one, there's a tremendous amount of venture in the system right now, a tremendous amount. It's a record high. Um, and this is from Crunchbase News, this is back in the summer. Uh, we saw that the first half was at $288 billion. And those are just, those are incredible numbers in this space. Um, it's very high. Um, from PitchBook, to give you an idea, the total volume in 2022 was 166 billion. But as of, this is, I think, uh, maybe late October numbers, we're already beyond that in 2021. We're way beyond that. So there's lots of money out there chasing startup companies. Uh, impact investing, you know what that is, ESG, sustainability, social governance, environmental, et cetera. That's gone uh, up to $5 billion from 3.7. Angel seed and first financings uh, up a little bit. Well, actually a lot, if you consider that this is only the three quarters, the first three quarters. Uh, Angel has already uh, exceeded all of the angel investment in 2020, uh, and uh, seed is about the same as all of the investment in 2020. So this is going to be a record year uh, for everybody. Now, half of those deals are more than 10 million. I'm guessing that most of the people here are probably early stage. Um, but uh, notice that a lot of that money has gone into late stage, but there's still plenty of money for early stage. So with that, uh, I'm not going to go through the data uh, any more than that, than just to tell you that there is a lot of money in the system, a lot of venture capital. And today we're going to talk about how to prepare to get some of that money. Now, um, keep in mind that you might call the market a little frothy. And what we're finding now is this kind of, let me back up a slide, because we're finding kind of an odd thing going on in the venture business is that VCs are really, really stretching for deals more so than before. In fact, Sequoia released a memo a few weeks ago. They're always at the front end of, of big news in the space about how they were rolling up and consolidating some of their funds and investing in things beyond traditional venture capital investments. 
the, the, the subtext, what that tells me is they're just not finding enough deals uh, to support them. Now that's Sequoia, so that's a little later stage, but that gives you an idea of what the ecosystem is like. So against that, let's kind of jump right into it. Let me start with this. Um, from the book, Straight Talk for Startups, uh, let me give you all the disclaimers and, war and, and, and warnings ahead of time. Like Randy Komasar, famous venture capitalist says, avoid venture capital unless you absolutely need it. I'm gonna talk more about what that means as we get into it. My clients tend to be tech startups that absolutely need it. They're not candidates for debt. They're not candidates for growth capital. Uh, you know, they're not candidates really for anything else other than venture capital, high risk, high return. So they absolutely need it. Are you a company that absolutely needs it? We're going to find out. But again, let me start with um, what not to do. So the slide that you should be looking at says money to not take, or maybe money not to take. And that's and part of what we're going to do here for today anyway, at least the first half of this, is talk about uh, whether you're a good candidate for venture capital, whether venture is for you, right? <clears throat> And um, uh, part of that is, is to know if you're not as well, right? It's like an old country song, I'm for love, but love is not for me. Well, you might be for venture, but venture might not be for you. So number one, think about the investor goals. If you're going to take venture, you're going to have a, theoretically anyway, a relatively quick exit, right? Because venture funds have a term. Usually it's between seven and 10 years. And so think of that as being an average of less than five years, meaning that the fund, your investor would really like you to exit on average in less than five years. Uh, is that consistent with your goals, right? If it's not, you know, you might not want to take venture. Uh, cooperation and accessibility. It's really nice if, and I know we have most of the people here are from outside Silicon Valley and most of the venture capital is here in Silicon Valley where I am. And that used to be a much bigger issue than it is now, um, because you really want to you want to have a route of communication to your investor. They're going to want that from you. They're going to want to be able to access you and your company, and sit on your board meetings and visit you. And you're going to want to get their co cooperation quite quickly when you need it. And what that really means is that it's better if you can take money from people that you can get a hold of and who can get a hold of you. That used to mean you would be in the same town. Uh, not so much anymore with uh, video conferencing technology and the fact that we've all gotten used to it now, um, even though it's hard to share screens. Uh, because of that, people are willing to do business in other parts than where they're actually located. Now, there was a time, it wasn't that long ago, in fact, it was two years ago, you know, before the lockdowns, that a Silicon Valley VC, they wouldn't drive 30 miles to Stockton, you know, to, uh, you know, to look at a company. They wouldn't go across the street. You know, they wanted you to be very, very close to them before they would even consider investing in a company. And part of that is because, you know, we're really spoiled here, in, or the VCs are really spoiled in Silicon Valley. There's so much deal flow. There are so many companies that there's really no need to go outside this area. That's the old way. I'm just telling you this. The second reason is it's a part of VC economics that we're going to talk about today. They just have so much bandwidth, right? And they're only able to make so many investments because by definition, that's what venture is, they're going to take an active role in managing your business, depending on how you define active. But they're probably, you know, you're probably going to have one on your board of directors. Uh, if not, they're going to have a board observer right, which means they can sit in on your board meetings or some other managerial right uh, as part of the deal. So in order to do that, they don't really want to have to get on a plane and fly across the country every time you have a board meeting. Now, again, that's the old way of doing things. Because of technology, I'm seeing many more local VCs investing in companies outside this area indeed outside this country. And I've heard many more VCs now say, we made an investment in a company where we never once even met the founders face to face. It was all on Zoom. Uh, control, you should just be aware, my kind of rule of thumb, and people argue with me about this, but my rule of thumb is that you don't give up control in your Series A round. 
You don't give up control until you get to series B. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but <clears throat> think of it this way. You should be able to sell, you know, you should be able to take venture money without losing control. You should be able to raise five to $10 million without giving up control. You will not be able to go beyond that without giving up control. Those are rules of thumb. There are exceptions. If you're in biotech, it's kind of a different, different world, different economics, but otherwise that tends to be true. And then finally, terms and valuation. Um, just be prepared. You know, you're, you know, we'll talk about terms more, but venture terms are tough. You know, I'll just warn you. It's not like debt. You know, you're, you're going to have a partner and it's going to be a pretty active partner. They're going to have very strong opinions uh, about, um, you know, about how you should run your business. And sometimes op those opinions are right. And sometimes you might not agree. And valuation we'll talk more about in a minute. So, Let's kind of drill down a little bit. You know, should you take venture capital? Are you a candidate for venture capital? So I just want you to kind of keep a few concepts in mind as you go through this. So number one, um, venture capital is an equity investment. It's not a debt investment. You are going to give up equity. That is ownership. And it's going to be between 20 and 40% in your first round. Now, I want you to kind of get used to that idea because I know I run across a lot of entrepreneurs who just have a lot of trouble with the idea that they have to give up ownership, uh, that they have to give up ownership. You know, I should probably remove the spotlight so you can see my slides, that they have to give up ownership before, um, before they can let someone invest in their company. And that's not a, you know, that's just not a good mindset to have in this space. Uh, you are going to have to give up ownership, and it's going to be quite a lot. And think of it this way: you know, you can have 100% of nothing, or you can have 50% of the next really big thing. So think about giving up equity. Uh, no near-term cash flow. So what I mean by that is that companies that take venture capital uh, tend to be companies that cannot get debt financing because they don't have cash flow to service the debt. If you do have cash flow, then you can get debt, which is way cheaper. You don't have to give up equity, right? Even venture debt, debt is cheaper with you know, some equity kickers attached to it. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got cash flow, there's something about your business model that might not fit the venture capital model, which is based on growth, like explosive growth. Um, it has to grow really, really quickly. And you can't do that if you've got excess cash laying around. You should be reinvesting that and building market share. That is the venture capital model. Good or bad, better or worse, you know, whether that makes good economic sense or not, that's just what it is. Uh, venture is, is high risk and high reward. Um, last week, I talked about some of the numbers, what the failure rate is of startup companies. It's high. <laughs> it's extremely high, even for venture capitalists it's very high, but the rewards are really high. I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. It's illiquid, right? <clears throat> These are illiquid investments. Uh, we're seeing a little less of that now because there's gotten to be a, a very robust secondary market in a lot of companies. Uh, companies are selling their common shares or their shares they got in their options or they're doing forward contracts more and more and are even platforms that facilitate that. So it's a little less illiquid than it used to be, I'll admit. But as a general rule, um, uh, an investment that the, that the VC makes in your company is not going to be sold until you exit or go IPO, go public. Really importantly, and this is maybe the one biggest defining factor as to whether you should take venture or not, is can the business scale? And by scale, I mean, can it, can it really increase exponentially, right? We know you can grow. But if you're going to take venture money, you have to grow exponentially. And are you able to do that? So you can sell one product. Can you sell 100? You know, that's what you'll have to impress the VCs with. And we talked about how quickly that has to happen. And then this last bullet point I should probably change because uh, people argue with me about that. Um, that Bill Reichert and I had a spirited discussion about this. He says, please stop telling your clients that they have to be in a huge market. He says, I can always tell when one of your clients comes to see me because the first thing I do is talk about how big the market is. They don't have to be in a big market. They just have to be capable of being a big company. 
To me, that's the same thing. I don't know, but maybe it's not. That's why I'm a lawyer, not a VC. Uh, but think of it this way, rather than huge market, just think that you have to be capable of being a huge company. So if your company can grow to a $10 million company, that is not interesting at all to any VC, maybe to angels, but not to a VC. Doesn't move the needle, right? If it can grow to 100 million, that's a little better, but you ought to be able to have that potential to grow to a billion, even if you're not going to make it. That's what really interests uh, the VCs. Which VC should you talk to? So it's good to just understand how these how these people sort of view themselves. <laughs> it might help you with your pitch and the way you approach them. Um, so I like to break it down this way. We have what we call thematic investors, thematic investors, and they're, they're betting on what they think the next big thing is going to be, right? And that spans probably a number of industries. Uh, we do a lot of venture capital panels across a, a number of industries. We'll, we'll do them on health tech, on space tech, on agriculture tech. I don't think we've done on ad, ad tech yet. We've done insurance tech. We've done all that stuff. What you'll find interesting is you'll find some of the same people kind of crossing several of, of those industries because they're what they're betting on is not particularly that technology or that industry. They're betting on what is going to be the next big thing. Um, Domain investors is a little bit more focused. They just focus on an industry. I do a lot of work with agriculture technology, and there are a lot of funds that invest only in ag tech, agriculture technology. Uh, quant investors are just looking at data. Where are they going to get the biggest numbers? Um, you know, I kind of like this example. People investors bet on a jockey, Draper Fisher. Uh, Bill Draper is a good example of that. Uh, not the horse. The horse would be the technology. Right? The jockeys, the people, the horse is a technology. Um, Steve Jurvetson is probably an example of a VC that really looks hard at the technology. Um, you know, there's a third one, and we talked about this last week, the venture studio model, where you don't bet on the jockey or the horse, you bet on, what was it, the racetrack, I think, or something like that. You bet, you bet on the environment that they're in and their support system. Um, it, I guess that's what you call stretching that... Uh, stretching that analogy a little too far. But know who you're talking, you know, what, what where your strengths are. And when you do approach the VCs, just understand how they view themselves because it will make a difference as to how you position yourselves with them. Uh, whether you have a good jockey, a good horse or a good racetrack. Now, it's really good, you know, I always say, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So. You want to know about venture capital economics. You want to know what the VCs are thinking and what they're going to want to see out of you. Uh, and again, this will really sort of inform uh, how you might approach them. So typical VC economics, uh, it's a 220 formula. Uh, the 2% is a management fee. And what that means is that the fund that they create is going to pay them 2% per year on the committed capital. That's all the capital that their investors in the, vet, in the pooled investment vehicle have agreed to invest. That fee is intended to cover overhead, salaries, you know, rent, stuff like that, right? General overhead. And it's almost universal. I mean, you see it vary a little bit, but that's the typical. 20%, sometimes it's two and a half, by the way. Smaller funds will be two and a half, but the bigger funds are 2%. And by the way, we do a whole hour on this, so we can talk about it. And then you'll typically see it decrease later on in the fund's life and then end after the investment period. But just understand early on what you're dealing with as a 220, maybe two and a half 20 formula. The 20% carried interest is really profit. That's they're broadly defined. 20%. So the, the uh, sponsors or the general partner, typically, uh, the individuals, that are putting the venture fund together, they go out to their investors, their investors invest, they, you know, that, that pooled investment vehicle will pay them 2%, will also pay them, the managers, general partner sponsors, 20% of the gains that that fund recognizes. So, and typically, like I said, the term is seven to 10 years. Now, why that's significant is because what the venture capitalist is thinking is how to keep his LPs, that's his investors, his limited partners, LPs, how to keep them happy. And 
how to keep them happy is to give them money, of course. So how much are they expecting to get? Well, typically they're expecting you know, if you work through all the math and figure out 30% annualized, et cetera, they're expecting to get two and a half to three times their money back. And if you work through all the math, figure out the carried interest, the management fee, by the way, that management fee can really add up. Think about it. If it's a 10 year term and it's a hundred million dollar fund, it's 2%, that's 2% a year over 10 years, that's 20%, it's $20 million. It's a lot of money. So there's a lot of you know, there, there, there's a big hurdle. We haven't even talked about hurdle rates, but we're not going to get into that today. But there is a big hurdle they have to clear before the LPs get their two and a half to three times their investment. And again, if you do the math, um, the fund has to earn about three to four times its investment, its overall investment to return to the LPs enough to get them their 30% annualized or two and a half to three times. So that's VC economics. What you should take away from that, um, is that VCs are expecting really, really, really big gains. And that's why they're taking so much risk because they're expecting you to be capable of delivering really big gains. Now, let's talk a little bit more about that because this is the interesting part. Um, on average, at least, you know, half of the investments the VC makes, even though they all look, you know, they're going to be vetted and they're carefully... Um, curate it and all of that. And maybe one in 10 startups even gets venture funding. Um, if that's probably less than that, it's more like one in a hundred, uh, depending on how you call how you define a venture capital company. But half of those are going to lose money, right? They're going to sell them for less than what they bought them for, right? 20 to 30% are going to return what they invested or maybe two times what they return. That doesn't leave many left. And the rest of those, you know, have to be really, really good home runs. They have to return quite a lot more than what they invested in order for the VC to hit their numbers. So let me say it another way. And this is from one of the books that I'll cite to you at the end. Uh, it's from Secrets of Sand Hill Road. Uh, the question, the, the VC who wrote that book you know, queries is, let's suppose that, um, uh, you know, 50% of my investments do lose money. And let's suppose that, uh, you know, 20 to 30% of the rest of them are singles or doubles. So and let's suppose I got, you know, one more company left in my portfolio, you know, but it's got to be 10x to 100x. Let's flip that around. Let's suppose I made one of my 20 companies I invested in uh, returned 100 times, right? or one of my 10 companies I invested in returned 100 times. What do the rest of the companies in my portfolio have to do at that point? And the answer is it doesn't matter because one of them has returned a hundred times. And that's kind of how these guys think, right? They're looking for that one really big home run. They're looking for the, you know, the, the, the Snapchat or the Uber or the Lyft or the Airbnb, that one really big company, you know, just look around Silicon Valley, you know, the VC funded companies, that's what they're looking for. And if they get one of those, then the rest of these don't really matter. So, you know, again, I know I keep harping on it. And I'm going to harp on it a little bit more. Um, again, large potential market. Read that to mean that you can have a large company. Um, first mover or first to market advantage. You'll find that a lot that, um, that uh, the VC, you, you'll find that there's oftentimes the most opportunity for that explosive growth and that scale, if you're the first company in the space, there's an advantage to that. Not universally or necessarily true, but generally, I would say that's true. It's an advantage to be the first one in the market that gives you an advantage over everybody else. That's important because when companies go to the venture capitalists, one of the parts of the story that is almost always the same is that we need to take this really expensive, high risk, high return money because we need to do a lot of marketing because we need to get out into the market ahead of everybody else before anyone else does. That is always part of the story. And it seems to be always part of the, the VC startup investment. Um, VCs look for long-term scale over short-term profits. Um, it's, sometimes it's kind of a surprise uh, to companies 
when they sit in that first board meeting and uh, you know they're, they're bragging about their numbers and uh, they hear the VC say, oh, no, 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 we don't want you to have EBITDA. We don't want you to have profit. We want you to be reinvesting and, and building scale. Who wants to pay ordinary income tax you know, on your profits when you could roll that money into the company, you know, build up the value and I get capital gains or maybe even better uh, when I sell? So it's long-term scale over short-term profits. That's why, you know, think of freemium model over premium model. Um, we talked about this already. Typically, it's not a company that has cash flow to service debt uh, because you shouldn't have a lot of cash flow if you're on that explosive growth trajectory. And if you do, you shouldn't be talking to VCs anyway. And then finally, and this is really, uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this, um, traction. And, you know, you hear a lot of buzzwords around this, but here's, here's kind of the, the buzzwords to keep in mind. Um, the first one would be proof of concept. You know, that's just that you can prove that you've got something, you know, that fits a market need or that works. Um, then, then there'll be traction, right? And traction is really, in my mind, proof that the market will accept it. Sometimes we call it product market fit, right? That people will buy this, people will pay for this. Um, and you might only have sold one, but you've shown that people will pay for it. And if you can sell one, you can sell 10. If you can sell 10, you can sell 100. And that brings us to the next thing, scale. You're going to use your first money into scale. That's what you're using that money for. It's really scale the product because you've shown the VC that people will buy it. So you have traction. Now, traction can be defined otherwise. You know, I, I like to think of it as revenue, but really what we're looking for is just proof that people are going to pay for this thing and that you have a business that's going to generate some money. Talk a little bit more about economics, um, especially as it relates to your company. When they invest in your company, you should understand, I've mentioned this before, that the VC is going to insist on participating in management. That means a board seat. <clears throat> your company, your corporation, you have a board of directors. We'll talk about why your corporation later if we have time. Uh, and the board of directors oversees the company and manages the company. They appoint officers to handle the you know, day-to-day the -day details, but they're ultimately responsible. VC is gonna want one of the seats on that board. If this is a series A, they'll probably have one of three. Uh, if it's a B, they'll probably have a majority. Uh, founder gets one, venture capitalist gets another one. And the third one you know, is either gonna be selected by everybody or it'll be an industry luminary or maybe the founder of the common stock, meaning everybody other than the VC gets to select the third. That's typical board for a first round funded company. Board observer, um, that means, look, we can't have, we don't wanna have a big board. We wanna keep it at three or maybe five, but you know, we've got a bunch of VCs in our round. So we're gonna give you the opportunity to sit in on our board meetings and you can comment and, you know, do whatever you want. You just can't vote. That's a board observer. So a lot of times when you have more than one investor in the round, one of them gets the board seat, they can vote, but then the other person from the other fund, they get to be a board observer so they can sit in. Uh, management rights, it's for people who are not board observers or on board seats and venture capital funds. This is a securities regulation issue. They have to have a right to management in order to qualify for their particular regulatory exemption. So you'll oftentimes see a management rights letter. Um, maybe that's, that's probably part two for that kind of detail. Term we talked about. So again, this is a slide on VC economics. Why am I telling you this? Because just think about what that means for the VC. They've got, and I've, and I've sat down many times to kind of sketch this out with clients. They've got a certain pool of capital they're only able to make a certain number of investments because they got to serve on those boards. And being on a board is a time-consuming thing, right? It's a time-consuming thing. They can't spread themselves too thin. So think about that when you think about how much money. So when you go to the VC and say, gee, would you make a small investment in me? I just really need a small amount of money. You might not be the right fit if it's a bigger fund. And they're thinking, oh, no, I got to do investments of at least this much in every company because otherwise I'm spread too thin. Now that's what, and we're kind of shifting now to again, what the VC is looking for in you. 
And you hear this all the time that uh, the VCs say, look, team is so important. We invest in team. We're betting on the jockey, not the horse or the track. You know, team is super important. Well, let's drill down on that and see what exactly that means. And, and the way I like to think about it is when you go in with your idea, um, no one's going to say this, but I can tell you what they're thinking in the back of their mind. They're thinking if they like your idea, it's not only, oh, great idea, great company. They're thinking, is this the best possible team I can find to execute on this strategy or to implement this strategy or execute on this idea? Well, what does that mean? And I think it means two things. Uh, I think domain expertise is super important, uh, meaning that the team understands a little bit about the market they're going into. As I said, I do a lot of work with agriculture technology companies, and I find that the most successful ag tech companies are the ones that understand the agriculture business, because otherwise they're building products that nobody wants. Secondly, I think it's really super important to have a technical co-founder. Um, because how else are you going to, if you're a tech company, okay, if you're a tech startup, because how else are you going to get anybody to put in the kind of pain that you have to put into as a founder uh, with, you know, low pay and long hours, uh, living on top ramen, unless you're a co-founder, if you have a really big reward on the back end. So I think those are really two important factors and different VCs will say different things. I can't deny that some of them will look at pedigree, no doubt about it. Um, I, um, oh, about five years ago, I ran across a company that I thought the team was not that strong, to be honest. I thought they had a good idea and a good product and potentially good technology, but I thought the team was not that strong, but boy, did they have pedigree. You know, they all came from the top schools in their area and top of their class and all of that stuff. So again, that's why I'm a lawyer, not a VC, because the VCs love that team. They love that pedigree. And if you've thrown enough money at a product, <laughs> you know, you're going to make it happen. So they're doing very well. I'm not going to tell you who it is. Uh, although I do, you know, that's one that got away because I did not take them on as a client because I just didn't think they, you know, I didn't think pedigree was enough, but the VCs did. So you never know. That's the other thing. You never know. Technology or product. Um, here's another one. It should, be, it should be whatever it is that you're selling. The VCs want to know that you solve problems and you address pain points. And the way it's been famously described uh, by um, Zeller Andreessen or Horowitz, one of those guys, said, you want, you know, we want to invest in companies that make aspirin, not, not vitamin pills. Meaning, you know, they want to invest in companies that have a product that people absolutely need right now. You know, not something that's nice to have, something they must have. Customer validation is really good, you know, VCs, as I said, they want to see customer validation. By the way, there was a really interesting Medium post I saw this morning on my way into work um, <clears throat> about this aspect, about a startup company that went and talked to a bunch of VCs and they had a solution that worked across a number of verticals. And when a VC said, who are your customers? And they said, well, it's these people and these people and these people, the, the VC laughed and said, yeah, good luck. Um, and uh, uh, what he meant by that is that, you know, I want you to have one customer. And if you've, if you're got a, if you've got a boil the ocean solution that works for all these different customers, you know, there's, you know, it's just not focused enough. It's not targeted enough. What do they say? Niches lead to riches. Um, <clears throat> so think about getting that customer. And for a lot of companies, because I see this all the time too, I hadn't thought about it in these terms until this morning, you know, they're really trying to prove too much and do too much. Instead, I think if they focused on that one vertical or that one, in fact, that one customer, you know, that could really use their product, they might have a lot more success than throwing a product out there and saying, oh, look, this is a, <clears throat> a floor wax and a dessert topping. You know, it works for everybody. Market size, we've talked about a couple of times already. So that's how the VC is going to pick you. How are you going to pick the VC? So um, let me give you a few tips. Some you'll read about in the bibliography. Some are just things that I know. Uh, and one is just things that I know, reputation. Now it may be a little, maybe it's worse, it's less, maybe it's more because of social media, but VCs have reputations. They absolutely do. 
And you'll know, for example, who signs term sheets, but doesn't close that often. The bigger VCs won't do that. The reputable VCs, if they go to the trouble of signing a term sheet, you know, highly likely they're going to close. And that's a big deal because if you're a startup company, once you sign that term sheet, you're also probably going to agree to what we call a no shot, keeping you out of the market for up to 90 days. And you're just stuck for 90 days now with this one potential investor. So you'd like to know that they're going to close. That's just one example. Another reputational issue is how do they treat their founders? Are they gonna fire the CEO as soon as they come into the company? Some VCs are very well known for that, okay? Again, not naming names, but um, it's almost comical, you know, because of, of uh, the stories around this as to, as to what the tells are when they're about to fire a CEO. Um, well, I will tell you what, um, hope I don't get sued. Uh, there's one very famous Silicon Valley VC is he always takes his dog to the board meeting whenever he's about to fire a CEO. Uh, he's just gotten a reputation. He always has his little dog with him the day when he decides to fire the CEO. And I remember uh, uh, it's a long time ago, a client called me up and he said, oh yeah, you know, the VC's here at the meeting. And I said, does he have his dog with him? Because if he does, you might want to dust off that resume. Um, so that's more of a <clears throat> facetious example, but that's one example. You know, some VCs will do that. They change management, but really the big, and they all do that. They will all eventually change your management. Just get used to that idea. Uh, the bigger issue is how they are going to treat the founders as they get into it. Are they litigious? Are they going to be hard for the later investors to deal with, right? Do they play well with others? You know, they have reputations. And these days it's easy to find because you don't have to just, hang out, you know, in coffee shops in Palo Alto to hear this stuff, you can go online. You can just Google it. Um, in fact, I have, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but someplace in my slides, I do have the story of, um, of um, well, I'll just tell you, it's circle up, just go Google it. They had a public dispute with their CEO uh, and they blogged about it, went right up on a WordPress site. So I think it was WordPress, it was on a blog site. So you can go online and you can find out what people think. How likely are they to close? We talked about that. Stage of the fund, really important, right? If you're super early, you wanna have an earlier stage fund, right? You wanna have a fund that does seed stage or pre-seed investments. Size of the fund, we talked about why that's important, right? A super big fund is not gonna be interested in making small investments with one exception because a lot of the big funds will do small investments, like a couple hundred thousand, and then forget about it just to get that seat at the table, maybe get pro rata rights, maybe get, have the opportunity to, you know, to, to, to get in later if it, if it turns out well. How much dry powder do they have? What do I mean by that? So a fund has an investment period. They take in the money and they call the capital over a period of time. Uh, it'd be nice to know how much capital that they're going to have over what period of time, right? And the reason why is because they might make your series A investment, but you're gonna need a series B. And who's your likely candidates? You're gonna go back to the investors that made the series A, right? Now, if they don't invest in series B because they don't have the money, well, first of all, that's bad because you can't get money from your, the easiest, most likely investor. Secondly, it does send a negative message to the market, doesn't it? It's like, geez, your A investor won't even re up in a Series B. And then you'll have to tell them the story. Well, yeah, but they're at the end of their fund, blah, blah, blah. That makes, brings me to the second or to the next point. Um, is this a serial, you know, serial venture capital sponsor? Is there a fund two, a fund three, et cetera? Because one of the things that happens that we don't like to talk about a lot is that Fund three will prop up the investments that fund two made, which is propping up the investments that fund one made, right? So if there are a series of funds, that might be your next round. My number one biggest one though is are they litigious? I say this in almost every presentation I give, just stay away from troublemakers, just stay away from them. They're easy to spot, it's all public record. You can Google it, you can go to the court websites, but if you see people that are constantly in court fighting with people, whether as plaintiff or defendant, 
That is not a good sign. Those are not people that you want to do business with, no matter how much money they have. Um, and I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories about companies that could have been, you know, huge, but they just, you know, ended up in court. And by the way, once you're in court, um, that is a really, really bad thing. It's very expensive, takes a long time, uh, and it's bad press. And then finally, who are you dealing with at this venture capitalist, uh, this VC fund? Because VCs have different levels of people that they send out, all the way from interns to partners. You know, and, and the further up you know, the food chain you are, the closer you are to getting a quick decision on your fund. And it also, you, know, you can't not communicate. It tells you a little bit about what they think about you as to who they send out to talk to you. So it's best, if you can, to deal with the decision makers. Entrepreneur VC fit. Okay, this is the example that I mentioned to you. Uh, circle up. So you can, you know, so I'll send you the link when you get the slides, but, you know, take a look at the email that the CEO of Circle Up had circulated. This is a VC founder relationship that did not work out, okay? And he blogged about it. Uh, there was not a good entrepreneur VC fit. So number one, does your venture capitalist have a big network? A lot of these rounds are, are either syndicated or what we call, call party rounds, where there's a bunch of investors that come into it. Right. In fact, you'd be surprised how many deals get done out on a golf course, you know, in, in Northern California, where somebody says, yeah, I'm investing in so and so I can get you in as well. Um, and by the way, if it's a hot company, that's a big deal. Right. That's how I know, you know, as a lawyer, I have no other way to know it. So I know when a company is really, really good. The way I know it's really super good is when they won't let their lawyer invest in it either. You know, and say, no, we don't have room for, for you. Uh, temperament, I'm going to spell temperament. Yeah, find a VC who can spell too. Uh, temperament, you just want somebody that you can get along with. Uh, let me just you know, leave it at that. And advice, you'd like to have a VC that is good at giving you mentorship and advice, right? And that's going to be able to offer more than just money. And that is at the heart of the VC model, right? They're not just money. You know, there's plenty of dumb money out there in the market right now. We talked a lot about that last week. Not to say that all that money is dumb. Let's just say there's plenty of money that does not offer advice along with the money. Um, VC, they offer you their experience. That's why you want VCs, in fact, because of their network, because they're going to take you to the next level, because they're going to see things in the market that you don't, like how you should focus on one customer instead of two different customers, stuff like that. Um, again, following up on this, um, company VC fit, it's the nature of venture capital and portfolio companies is that they tend to be capital intensive, meaning they need a lot of money to execute their plans. That's why they're going to the VC, because otherwise they would just fund through operations. Uh, it tends to be that they need follow-on funding um, and that you're going to have a VC that can provide that follow-on funding. And the biggest thing is time to exit. Maybe not the biggest thing but a big thing is time to exit. Your VC has a fund. Now, I'll give you a war story. I had a company, they took venture. Um, it was during the last depression that we had, recession we had, not depression, I'm not that old. Um, last recession we had, and the fund had come, the venture fund had come to the end of its natural life at the nadir of the recession. And the year before that, the company uh, taken the money, used the money to acquire another company. They spent $40 million acquiring another company. A year later, we're in the, the depths of a, of, a, of a recession. And the VC says, oh, my fund has just come up, my term's up. Uh, I'm tired of this. I want to exit and just pay my investors whatever they got. I've had my 100X, who cares about you? And I want to go on and you know, just wait until the economy comes back and start you know, my next fund. So you, Mr. Portfolio Company, it's time for you to exit, right? And they had a big enough presence on the board that they forced that decision to happen. And that company was sold for $30 million, all right? A year later, the economy came back, you know, and the buyer of that company had a very, very valuable hot company. Those founders got so screwed in that deal, and it was just bad timing. They didn't have a fund that was going to give them enough of a runway 
and our timing was terrible. So that can happen. Don't let that happen to you. Kind of be strategic and think that out. You know, is this VC going to be with me as long as I need them to be to exit? Or are they going to push me to sell before I'm ready to sell? Wow, we're not even going to get into any of the technical stuff today. I guess that's why this is part one and not part two. Structuring for venture capital. Um, this is stuff we'll talk more about uh, next week, but I'll give you a preview. Uh, so number one, we talked a lot about the business model already, right? It's got to be scalable. You got to have traction. You know, you, you've heard all these words before. Um, choice of entity. I'll ju just, you know, three words, Delaware C Corporation, two words in a letter, Delaware C Corporation, right? That's, that's what VCs invest in. Uh, if you're from some other part of the country, as 66% of you are, you're probably thinking, well, why can't I just use my Kansas corporation? Uh, well, you can, but a VC won't invest in that. They want you to be a Delaware corporation. And if, and if, you're, if you're a little more, if you've been around, you're probably saying, well, why can't I use an S corporation and not a C corporation? We'll talk more about what that means later. And the answer is because the VCs will only invest in a Delaware C corporation. Now, that doesn't mean you have to move to Delaware. It means your corporation is organized under Delaware law and it will actually qualify to do business in every state where, it, where it's required to because it's conducting business. Um, but just keep that in mind. Uh, and the, the reason I'm mentioning it is because you wanna start out as a Delaware corporation. It's just easier. You don't have to. You can start off as a Kansas corporation and you know migrate to Delaware later. Uh, it's a well, depending on the state, it's, if, you're, if you're unfortunate enough to start in California, it's not a simple process. You actually have to do a merger. If you're in other states, you can file a one-page conversion document. But why bother? Just start in Delaware. Um, your cap table is going to, you're going to want that to look a certain way when you get to talk to the VCs. We'll talk more about this next time. But the thing that messes up cap tables most often uh, is just selling too much equity through convertible instruments like convertible notes and safes and giving up too much of your company, not really realizing it until somebody forces you to create a cap table. And then you come to find out that you, the founders, don't have near as much of this company as you thought you did. And the VC says, wait a minute, founders, there's not enough equity in this to properly motivate you to put in the long hours with low pay that I'm expecting you to, to make me a lot of money. So pay attention to the cap table. Vesting, you know, people have to be subject to vesting. And uh, this used to be a story. I used to have to tell people about this and explain it. I think everybody understands this now. And vesting is the concept that you earn into your ownership in the company. And if you leave the company before you're fully vested, you have to give back some of that ownership. You vest in it over time. That's the concept of vesting. Believe it or not, believe it or not you know, some lawyers don't even understand that. They think that vesting means ownership. It's not what it means. You know, vesting just means that your, your shares, your interest is subject to forfeiture or a right of repurchase by the company. Um, in debt, uh, VCs hate debt because it stands ahead of them on the, in the distribution waterfall. So ideally you'd like to have as little debt as possible when you get to that point. We've got a couple minutes, so I will keep going. Now, uh, you'll find, uh, now we'll get into some of the nomenclature. Uh, it's almost silly, but you'll hear people talk about a seed round or a pre-seed round or a series seed round um, before you actually get to series A. Well, why is that? Because the idea is, is that, you know, you're gonna take venture money and that's gonna be series A and everything before that is not series A. Everything before that, you probably had to show traction, but you didn't have to show scale. Series A, you have to show you can scale, right? So if you can't show that, then you're not gonna to go to series A. You're gonna call it something else. Um, and then you just go through the alphabet. I've had companies exit at series Q, Q series R, series S, believe it or not. Um, but these days, these numbers are really, these letters are really meaning something. And it's more art than science. But a series B really means something. It means you've gone to that next level. And a lot of times companies run out of money before they go to that next level. Or alternatively, they just want to sell more stock at a different price, really. And they'll call it series A1, series A2. 
until they actually are at a point where they're going to raise a lot of money that they can properly call a series B because it's a big round. And, and again, they're, you know, they're at what, is, what I'll call is the next level. Maybe we'll, you know, um, maybe we'll end with this. And then, although I do have a lot of slides left, but, um, but when you're thinking about what level you're at, you know, are you at traction? Are you at scale, et cetera? Are you at proof of concept? Again, that'll inform what types of funds that you approach. Now there's micro VCs funds, which are really just angels using other people's money. It's another way of thinking about it. Um, and they'll do small investments, seed stage funds early, but they're the first, you know, we'll call it institutional. That means a fund money in, and then you get on to mid stage at series B and beyond at late stage, which is exactly what it sounds like. And oftentimes VCs will invest together. As I said, you'll have a lead VC that will set the terms and then a bunch of followers and what we call, call party rounds. We're at one o'clock. So, um, I'm going to end with this slide and open it up to questions. Just keep in mind, it's not just the VCs that you're dealing with. There should be an accountant in the mix. You want good numbers. We'll talk more about that next time, but numbers are super important. You just cannot get numbers wrong. Even though everybody knows your projections are all pie in the sky and are forward looking and they're made up, um, you, know, you wanna have good numbers. Uh, sometimes there's a banker, a broker, or a finder. You know, I've, I'm not, you know, I'm more copacetic with that now than I used to be. Um, and um, oftentimes there's mentors and advisors involved in the process. Okay, I'm going to stop the share. Okay. And uh, open it up to questions. First of all, I don't see chats here. Okay, Q&A. Use the Q&A box if you have questions. All right, so somebody is asking um, if you have a thematic VC that invests in and partially controls startups in the same technology, could a conflict of interest arise when startups are pursuing competing goals? That is a great question. It is a great question because yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you have to be super careful about that. So what I mean, and by the way, if you have questions, put it in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, but what, what I mean by that, by thematic, like for example, we just did a panel here a few weeks ago on space tech. We had a bunch of VCs on our panel talking about investing in space. That's what they do. That's, you know, call it a domain too, I guess. But Keep in mind, uh, they're investing in a bunch of companies in the same area, but probably none of them are competing because they're all servicing a different, different aspect of that. But you raise a good question because you really do, before you even talk to a VC, uh, in fact, I'm going to put that on my slides, uh, you should make sure that they're not conflicted out so they can't invest in you because they've already bet on your competitor. And if they've already done that and they still want to take the meeting with you, yeah, well, I smell a rat. You know, I don't think they're interested in investing. I think they're just, you know, they're just curious. They're just, you know, window shopping, nosing around. By the way, I'm going to post my information again for those of you who joined late. It's how to get a hold of me. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if I haven't mentioned that before. So, yeah, worry about conflicts and pay attention to that. Okay. Hi, I have an AI enabled hardware project. Uh, target markets, the U.S. Okay, I'm with you so far. I plan to raise money in the U.S. I have traction in my own country, but not in the U.S. Is it enough to have traction in my target market or, or to show pre-orders is enough? Great question. That is the model that I am used to seeing all the time. We see a foreign founder that's done well, and they, they've shown they can execute in their home country, and then they come here into the U.S., now, ideally, you would like to have sales here in the U.S. because it kind of depends on your product. Looking at your question, I think your product is pretty universal, I would think, um, or, or the demand is universal. But you might get that objection, well, sure, you know, that plays well, you know, in Botswana, but I don't know if U.S. customers will want to buy that product. Okay, uh, 
But if you can get beyond that objection, the fact that you've been able to, to market this in a foreign country, that ought to be enough to create FOMO. You know what FOMO is, right? You want lots of FOMO, right? You want to go to the VC and say, and give them that fear of missing out. You want them to say that, look, someone's going to get into this. No one knows about it yet because I'm not in this country yet. But as soon as we launch, boy, oh boy, the world's going to know and then it's going to be too late. So yeah, I think you're, yeah, if you've shown you can do this in another country, you should be able to attract interest here. Be better if you had sales here, but in some sense, you know, maybe not. What do you mean by dry powder? I mean cash. I mean money. Um, I mean I mean that the VC. Okay, so so the fund. Let's say it's a hundred million dollar fund, right? And they've called the first twenty million and they've invested it. Well, you know what? They got another 80 million to go. They got lots of dry powder. So when they make an investment in your company, they'll have enough money around that they can probably participate in your next round, in your Series B round. They have dry powder. That's what I mean. Uh, here's a good question. Never mind, you covered it. <laughs> now I'm curious. How do you show you can scale? What are the indicators? Well, nothing succeeds like success, right? Um, you've shown that you've been able to sell the product and you've shown growth. And in a way, it's um, some people even think it's a little like a Ponzi scheme, because if you think about it, how do you get that scale? Well, you, you take a lot of money and you, you know, you give it to Google ads or, or whatever, and you just, you just market the heck out of it. And now you get sales and now you've shown that people will buy the product and it's working. Uh, and then based on that, you can go raise more money, you know, to buy even more ads and show even more scale. Uh, that's the cynical view of scale. Uh, the non-cynical is you just have to show that people are buying and that your market is growing and that there's a real need for it. You can all think of a lot of companies like that uh, that are scaling. And by the way, once they start to the scale in venture capital land, it happens really fast, almost as fast as crypto. Um, if you're the CEO of your company, uh, should you also be a board member? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, the board oftentimes, if not always, has a CEO uh, on it. And typically, uh, so with early stage, you're, you're going to have a small company. You're going to have a three-member board. The VC has one. The, the founders get to select one, and that's almost always the CEO. And then that third one is going to be maybe another representative of the common or maybe an industry luminary that the VC and the founder got together and agreed on or something like that. But almost always, yeah, your CEO is going to be on the board. And that's really valuable. I mean, I mean, that's you want the CEO is going to report to the board. And it's easy to if you're in the board meetings every every week, every quarter. Um, you mentioned that VCs like to sit on the board. How much control do they like to have? In other words, the leadership may decide a pivot is needed, but the VCs want you to stick to the plan when you know it's not working. Oh, well, that's a drag. Um, like I say, my rule of thumb, and keep in mind, these are rules of thumb, so there are exceptions, is that you don't give up control in the first round. Uh, you'll give them one of three board seats. Uh, you will give up control in the B. And at that point, they can force that pivot if they need to. That's usually when they fire the founder too, the CEO, because that's when they got the votes to do it. So you got a bigger issue though. Um, if you and your, your VC have a fundamental disagreement on the direction of the company, that is a really bad, bad thing. That's a bad place to be. Um, it's going to be, first of all, it's, you're not going to get any follow-on investment from them. Secondly, I don't know how good a cheerleader they're going to be for you going forward. Um, and, and this is a, a problem I've, I've, I've certainly heard about, you know, and I've, and, I've, and I've been through and I've sat in panels and listened to people talk about it. And um, I don't know, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe couples counseling, you know, or something like that. Okay, what is the best way to meet VCs? For example, we launched a prototype and have beta users if that matters. Yeah, that was probably one of my slides I didn't get to. So I'm glad you asked. The absolute very best way to meet a V, well, first of all, a warm introduction. Absolutely. Um, 
I know what you want to do. You want to send your business plan to 100 VCs you found online. None of them are going to read it. You know, uh, they're just not. Or your PowerPoint. They just get way too many of those to even read. Um, I get way too many of those to read, and I'm not even a VC. So that's not a good way. A good way is a warm introduction. But not all introductions are created equally. There's a hierarchy. The number one best way you can be introduced to a VC is by the founder of a company that the VC has invested in, right? Because that founder knows something about the VC and for some reason thinks that they're a good fit. That's going to cause them to take a look. So that's the number one best way. Uh, the second best way is to be introduced by somebody who knows the VC and for whatever reason brings you that credibility that, oh yeah, they know who we are. They know who this company are. For whatever reason, they think, for some reason, they think we're a fit. That's a good introduction. So, you know, that's the second best way. Uh, another good way is in-person at events. That happens a lot, more than you might think, because VCs like to talk on panels and they like to seek out deal flow. And if they can meet a person, uh, so there's a famous story here. Um, uh, there's a venture firm called Forerunner Ventures that invested in Dollar Shave Club. And it's, uh, read this in one of the books in the bibliography, but I know all those people anyway. But uh, when the uh, founder of that company first presented, uh, which is a unit, you know, got acquired for, a, I think it was more than a billion dollars. Anyway, when the founder of that company first presented it to that particular VC, it was a pass, right? And they'd never met. It was just, uh, hey, I see you do consumer space. I got a really good consumer product. There's a lot of, you know, here's all that we got, everything. It's everything you would want. And the VC passed on it. You know, they said, yeah, I just don't feel good about this. And a lot of VCs did. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. You know, that company, it's like nobody really got it, really understood the product or the market or what they were doing. And then uh, fast forward a little later, uh, the VC that passed on it met the founder at an event. I think it was like a party or something, but there's a million of them in Silicon Valley, you know, pretty much every night in non-COVID times. Uh, in fact, multiple every night. And the founder met the VC and the VC managed to talk to the founder in a different setting and said, you know what? I'm going to take another look at that because I kind of believe in this guy now that I've met him. And they took another look, they made that investment. It turned out to be a very, very good thing for everybody, both for the company and for the VC. So, you know, that personal, you know, I know this is the age of Zoom, but I'm telling you, there's nothing that beats that personal, you know, in-person um, kind of interaction. And in fact, you might've heard on one of our panels here, we did for ID to IPO. One of the VCs said, you know, I've invested in a lot of companies now that, where I've never met the founder. And um, on a couple of cases, I wish I'd had. Because if I had sat down, you know, and had a cup of coffee with them, I would have learned enough about them that I would not have made the investment. Well, I think the flip side is true. They might have learned enough about you that they do want to make the investment, right? So I just think those personal interactions are really important. So that's way off on a tangent, but okay. Can a rapidly growing company bypass seed and go directly to Series A? Uh, theoretically, yes. And that does happen, okay? It happens most often with serial entrepreneurs who have established relationships with VCs uh, or who can show that they've, you know, that, that they've got, they can show that they're there already. They can show that they can scale already. Now, 20 years ago, um, uh, I know I used to represent a lot of, believe it or not, kids in dorms or dorm rooms at Stanford who had never formed a company and they had a PowerPoint and they were getting venture money. Uh, that used to happen a lot more, you know, before the dot com, the dot bomb <laughs> phase when companies could get funded based on a PowerPoint. It happens a lot less now. Just even though there's more money out there, it happens a lot less. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you gotta have something really strong going for you. And it's gotta be something more than just a great idea and a plan. And that's a hard conversation I have quite often with founders when they say, hey, I'm gonna go talk to all these VCs. 
uh, because I need $10 million and then we're off and running. And I say, yeah, you know, I think maybe you should raise a, you know, less than a million first and prove that people will buy your product and then go talk to them. You know, and the reason why is you poison the well. You really poison the well. A lot of times you get one shot with these guys. So you want to make it your best shot. Now, they said in Hamilton, something like that. So you don't want to go to them before you're ready. And, and they'll always be polite and say, oh, you're not ready. Come back when you're ready. But are they going to let you back in when you're ready? I don't know. You know, by that time, you know, they might have moved on. So, yes, it's theoretically possible. But I just, you know, I don't know. I don't see it as often as you might think. What would your fundraise advice be to a new automaker? Uh, would, okay, that's a very specific question. Um, let me broaden that a little bit. And I've actually talked, you know, there's a big, is anyone here from Detroit? Chat me if you are. I know they have a big, you know, it's a big auto town and they've got an auto tech industry and I've talked to a lot of companies around that. Um, I guess this would come into our domain investors or thematic investors. So suppose that, that you do have something for this particular market, you know, and it's, and it's very focused. In this case, it's on the auto market. Uh, my fundraise advice is that you talk to enthusiasts and people who really understand and know that market. Uh, I mean, that's, I think that's a natural. And they might not be here in Silicon Valley. Now, there are plenty of VCs here who like flying cars. Um, I think August Capital, I think uh, Jervitson does. So if you happen to, you know, you'll, you might be able to find them here, but something like that, uh, you might find your investors focused around the area that's known for that industry. Again, I do a lot of agritech <laughs> and you'll find uh, some really, really high quality, good VCs in agritech in Minneapolis, Fargo, believe it or not, in St. Louis, in Chicago, out close to the agricultural markets. I, I, and your auto product seems to me to be uh, maybe something that would get some interest there. How much power does it give you <clears throat> as a CEO and a board member to get rid of a board member you do not like? <laughs> um, so unless that board member resigns, <clears throat> uh, they can only be kicked off your board depending on what your bylaws say by a majority of the shares uh, or by a majority of the board uh, subject. But, but you know, it's not that easy because once you get a VC board member, they're not going to let you kick them off easily. They're going to have a voting agreement that basically says, look, as long as I own stock in your company, I have the right to select one board member. And guess what? It's me for now until I change my mind. So, yeah, you're going to be stuck with your board members. Just keep that in mind. It's, you know, if you don't like, make sure you like them before they come on your board, because uh, it's hard to get rid of a board member. If it's an investor who has a voting agreement, and if it's not a voting agreement, you still got to get a majority to go along with you. <clears throat> oh, we got someone here from Fargo. I was in Fargo. I lived there for four years, practice law. That's why I do so much agritech before I came to Silicon Valley about that. Um, by the way, this is the only two people you're ever going to meet from North Dakota, right here, right now. So, you know, what are the odds? I'm building an MVP and a pilot customer. Um, customer will pay a subscription fee after the trial period. Is that a good time to raise? Yeah, that's great. I mean, you show them people will pay for your product. You know, you, you've done it, you've shown it, you've got traction. Now, I'm not saying it's a good time to raise from VCs because they're these days, they want to see a little bit more, but that's enough to go out and raise money. So a micro VC, an angel, a super angel, an angel fund, stuff like that, depending on, you know, depending on all your other metrics, like how much you're raising, how much revenue you have, et cetera. But that's exactly what I'm talking about. You got someone that's willing to pay you. Marketing is my primary motivation for VC capital. How many users I need on a social platform before considering pitching? Yeah, let me tell you, I've seen this happen. Um, you go in to talk to the VC and you say, yeah, I've got this killer app. That's what I want you to fund. Well, everybody knows you can go to the app store and you can find out, um, <clears throat> holy cow, another North Dakota. That is like the weirdest thing. I mean, that is like a... a, a, a you know, a lunar eclipse, it just happens so rarely. How about that? I guess it's because we all leave. 
we all move. Um, anyway, back to your question, they can see on the app store how many downloads you have, right? So they kind of know how popular you are right away. So how many users do you need on a social platform? Well, I wouldn't rely on that as your metric unless it's really powerful, uh, if that's what you're going in to pitch. Uh, so how do you get there? Well, you know, come come back, <laughs> come back uh, to um, come back to last week's presentation on talking to angels and early stage investors, right? <clears throat> that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. Because yeah, I, I just find it hard for these platforms to get venture money, not early money, but venture money uh, until you've got lots of users. Because that is your traction. You show that people are on your, on your system. Do you, I see ratched, do you mean like ratcheted investments were based on performance or lack of performance? BC gets more equity. We'll talk about that in part two, but the answer is no, never in this valley. However, once you get out of this country, yes, because other parts of the world have much different terms. So if you're taking money from a Chinese VC, for example, you will oftentimes see a term that says, look, if your company doesn't do as well as we expect, our interest increases, right? It's like the deal's never done. You know, it's always changing. It's dynamic. It's a dynamic deal. So you'll see terms like that outside of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, you will not, you know, just, just never. Um, how likely are Silicon Valley VCs to invest in an early stage company outside the United States? Way more likely now than they used to be, okay? But still, you're still fighting against the fact that VCs are spoiled here. You know, they have so many companies to pick and choose from that they don't really need to go anyplace else and make it difficult. So if you're going to ask them to do that, um, you really need to, um, if you're going to ask them to do that, you really need to show why you're special, okay, and why they need to go to your country to make that investment. Now, you can ask them, and they'll say, oh, sure, we'll invest outside the country, you know, no problem. We do that all the time. Just keep in mind, you got to be really above the crowd uh, to, to have that happen. Somebody asked a technical question. With Alice, it's a famous court case. How do you decide between going for a patent and trade secrets? Well, I believe in patents. Um, I think you should patent early and often. Uh, one of the ways you might value your company is to be patented early and often. So um, yes, get a patent. Now here's, okay, I know that sounds a little simplistic. So you get a patent for the stuff that is easily uh, reverse engineered is another way of thinking about it. Um, you might not want to patent uh, the stuff that is hard to reverse engineer and it's hard for somebody else to figure out. This is way off topic, but I'm gonna say it anyway. And in fact, you can read a whole chapter on this in my new book, which I swear to God is gonna be out by Christmas. It's called 10,000 Startups. Anyway, um, and here's why, because you know patents are public. So if you're in a space where there's 800 pound gorillas that might come litigate against you, well, they might try to attack your patent or they might just infringe it and say, what are you gonna do, sue me? You got no money. So, um, so you wanna be careful about patenting the stuff um, that they would never figure out anyway. So I know I come down a little bit differently than patent lawyers on this, but I say, be kind of careful about that. You might wanna just rely on trade secret. Uh, if there's no way they're going to figure it out. If it's something they could figure out anyway, then first to file system, you know, get that patent so you've got priority. Well, we got a lot of questions coming in all of a sudden. Can you cover the pros and cons of corporate strategic family foundations and PE firms? In the last seven minutes I have, I don't think I can, but I can tell you that those are all different funding sources. And I'll give you a couple of high level things. Um, corporate strategic. Um, I like doing strategic deals, although they're way different. I think you generally get better valuations. I know some people say financial investors give you better value. Uh, you'll get an investor that's going to be less meddlesome in your business uh, than a VC because they're after something a little bit different than a financial return or even running your business. They're after something else, maybe an acquisition candidate target or a, a license or something like that. Uh, the downs, so that's the plus side. 
And I've talked to enough people who've done corporate investment that say, oh, I'll never do that again. I can never get a hold of those guys. They won't sign anything. You know, they had a change of management and now they don't care about us. Uh, so that's the downside or the plus side. I can't remember if that was the plus or the downside. But the, 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 the flip side of that um, uh, is that they're going to ask for a right of first look or right of first refusal or something like that when you do sell your company or sell your product. And you're going to have to negotiate that. And the fact that they have that string uh, might make you less attractive to other acquirers, might make you less attractive to other investors. So, th so this is one where you really need to sit and think about whether you're going to do corporate strat strategic, because there are pluses and minuses, although we almost always find a way to do it. Family foundations, that's early money. Um, not nearly as rigorous as the VCs who are, you know, have their fiduciary obligations to report this to their investors. So I think that's easier money to get and it's earlier money and it's smaller money typically. PA, PE firms is a whole different ball game, a whole different ball game. It's a different kind of company. It's a, you know, different kind of exit. It's a different kind of deal. They're gonna have cumulative dividends, for example, in PE deals. That's like interest. They're gonna take something like interest on the money they give to you and VCs never will. So it's, it's just a much, it's a, you're a much different company if you're looking at PE firms and if you're looking at venture. Uh, typically, if you're looking at PE firms, you're probably profitable, right? You're probably a, a much safer bet. Um, uh, or there's probably some strategic benefit where the PE firm is gonna combine you with some other company and roll you up. Uh, I'm doing a lot of those deals these days. Is it easier to get a VC interested if you have a patent? I think so. You know, I think patents are valuable. One of the ways people value companies are partially the number of patents. Um, that assumes it's a good patent and not what we call a junk patent because they're going to do diligence on it. But yeah, I still believe, you know, subject to the strategic stuff I said early, patent early and often. What are the chances of a solopreneur getting VC funding? Finding a co-founder is strenuous at the moment. Boy, I know it is. It's hard to do. Um, and I don't have a magic bullet for that. Uh, we talked a little bit about that last week. Uh, I, I think you just have to enter the rainforest and just meet a lot of people. But um, solopreneurs can get funded. I just have heard enough VCs say that successful companies have co-founders. I've heard that enough times and I believe it, especially technical co-founders. Now, not all of them, I know you're going to point to some big examples, but just look at all the examples of successful companies that had co-founders. In fact, uh, I think I've got a slide on that later on in this, but uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Apple, they all had co-founders, right? So uh, I think your chances go way up if you get a co-founder. I'd like to hear your thoughts and experience on the success rate of securing pre-seed seed round without a friends and family round or angel investment, especially as it's beneficial to not dilute before the VCs. Well, yeah, that happens. I mean, you'll have some founder money, of course, but that happens all the time, um, provided that you, you're able to, to get to where you need to be. And you can show that, that, you know, if you can show that traction, you know, and you can show that scalability when you get there. Now you raise an interesting issue here about it's beneficial to not dilute before the VC. So let's pause on that for a minute. Why is that true? Um, and, and here's the example. You're out, you're raising money from friends and family. You're selling these safes, right? Simple agreements for future equity or convertible notes or whatever it is. Uh, you're selling these instruments that are going to convert to equity down the road. But you don't know how much they're actually going to get because it's tied to some future valuation. I mean, you could ballpark it if you were to sit down and actually do the math, but you haven't done that because why should you? Why bother? Let's just keep selling them. People are buying them. Then you get to the institutional investor and they want to see a cap table and they do some pro, they want a pro forma cap table, or maybe they have you do some pro forma numbers. And that's the first time it dawns on everybody that you, the founder, have already given up a lot of your company. So let's say that your safe holders have 40% and your VC needs 40. So that's only 20% left and you haven't even done an A round yet. And the VC says, look, you've given away too much of your company. There's not enough there to motivate the founding team and the management to get to where we need equity to do that. We'll pass. 
I've seen that play out. So that is, so you're absolutely right. You know, be careful about early dilution. Any tips for blockchain companies that want to fundraise through token issuances, a SAFD, Delaware or overseas? Yes, uh, uh, all of those deals, if they're ICOs, are being done overseas. Now, um, you can do, I have clients now, I do a lot of blockchain, clients now doing deals here in the U.S. On, on, on private exchanges where you can sell to accredited only investors. If you want to email me, I'll give you names of a couple of them. Uh, but that's a much smaller universe. And here's the big thing, you don't get immediate liquidity, right? You buy that token, you have to hang on to it for the rule 144 holding period before you can go sell it to somebody else. And there's no exchange and you can't sell it to just anybody because uh, that would be a public offering and we can't do those in the US because of our SEC. All right, uh, so do it overseas if you're if you're, you know, if you're doing ICO, if you can just have a limited number of accredited, so it'll hold on for a while to do it in the U.S. Last question. If I have a fully functional internet service platform, okay, ready to go, need to push it to market, what's the best suggested approach? What's the best method to market, sell it to a global market? So this is not about investing. This is about going to market. That is way above my pay grade. How to, push a, how to push a company in the market. All I can tell you is that you got a little bit of chicken and egg here because you need to show traction to get money. Uh, you need to get money to show traction. And that's last week's talk. That's why you need friends, family, angels, and seed investors to get involved early on uh, and get you out into that market. Okay, with that, we are at 1.30 Pacific time. I wanna thank all of you for joining. Sorry that I talked too fast and didn't get through many of my slides. Uh, join us for part two whenever that is, and we'll try to get through some more of my slides. This is Roger Royce, Haynes and Boone from Idea to IPO, and we will see you next time.